Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is May 11, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, it's not just the economy, stupid. It's the deliberate sabotage of the economy. Hillary gets only a third of the vote she did eight years ago as she loses badly to Bernie Sanders. And half of Sanders voters say they would vote for Trump over Hillary. And we look at one example of human trafficking and slavery. Vietnamese girls as young as 13 kidnapped and sold to Chinese men as brides. Then, I was propagandized as a kid to believe that everything America did was great. And like a lot of people, as I got into the world in the 70s and 80s, I realized that wasn't true. But I do believe America is better than any other political and social system that's ever been created in the world. So I don't care what your trendy argument, I don't care what your hashtag argument is. If you do not stand for free speech, you do not stand for America. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. And welcome back. West Virginia is feeling the burn. And we see that Mr. Sanders has toppled Mrs. Clinton in a state that she won back in 2008, notching another victory to keep him on the path to the nomination. With 61% of precincts reporting Tuesday evening, Sanders led Clinton 51% to 36%. And also with Sanders' projected victory, he's slated to win the majority of the 29 pledged delegates at stake. Now, it's going to be a very narrow window, but Bernie is still in this thing. And for all you Sanders supporters out there, you are doing somewhat of a good job trying to get Bernie out there in the limelight. He lost a lot of uh, esteem just due to the superdelegate process. And I'm not a Sanders supporter, but I do want him to have a fair shake in this election cycle. So uh, good job to you guys keeping him out there and not letting Miss Clinton uh, just come in and take all the delegates with the superdelegate process. I mean, before even... Uh, Sanders gets to the states and the voters get to the polls. The delegates are already sucked up during the super delegate process. So uh, we'll see how much longer he can hold on. Now, in other political news, we see that Obama's speechwriters are actually laughing about the American people believing Obama's lies. They sit around here and they talk about, hey, Bob, you know, it's great when you wrote that line about this or that. And here's a clip of this. Uh, these guys talking about all the lies they put into Obama's speeches. The point is that you have equal impact on serious speeches because it's about style, use of language, etc. Uh, I really like, I was very, the, the joke speech is the most fun part of this, but the things I'm the most proud of were the more serious speeches, I think. Healthcare, um, uh, economic speeches, and I think I... Love it wrote the line about... Um, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. How dare you? Huge impact. And you know what? It's still true. No. Yeah. And now, while they may be laughing it up and having a good time, we have a story here that is no laughing matter, and that is Vietnamese girls being smuggled into China and sold as child brides. The villages along the Vietnamese-Chinese border are a hunting ground for human traffickers. Girls as young as 13 say they've been tricked or drugged and brought into the country. Young Vietnamese women are valuable commodities in China, where the one-child policy and long-standing preference for sons has heavily skew the gender ratio. And this is for all the people who say that overpopulation is a big issue. Now, I do understand that you do have some cities where that's an issue, like New York, Mumbai, or other places where, you know, we go down the street the wrong part of the day or the right part of the day, where it may be. You can't even walk down the street. It's like being uh, at Disneyland or something like that. But the thing that people don't realize, if you go to more open areas, like I'm from the state of Oklahoma, there's plenty of open space out there. So people who talk about overpopulation usually come from these big cities where they've never seen a patch of green grass or, you know, a cow uh, walking around in a pasture. And more to that, uh, this brings to light a very serious problem. I was talking to Dave Knight about this just a little bit ago. And he says it's getting to the point in places like China due to these world one-child policies that eventually uh, people are going to start invading other countries just to get women. Uh, you have to think about this stuff years ahead. You can't just say we're going to get rid of all the women or say you can only have a certain number of women. Because you see, uh, they're bringing girls in just for the main purpose of being uh, sex slaves, essentially. Uh, these young child brides are forced into these countries. So uh, it's a very serious issue, and the answer isn't to limit the number of children that people can have. You should have better uh, societal means to help people take care of the children that they do have so it doesn't become a burden on uh, anybody else. Now, as we're talking about the serious news, it continues with a blast from ISIS. They've come out and attacked an Iraqi city, Baghdad, and we see that ISIS says it's behind a series of attacks in Iraqi's capital Wednesday 
that targeted Shiites and left more than 90 people dead. At least 64 people were killed when a car bomb went off in a market at Baghdad, according to Iraqi police. And experts have said that the security vacuum has opened in Iraq amid political turmoil. And this is the old adage, you guys probably heard it, you take a drug dealer off the street and next week there's another drug dealer to replace them. It's the same thing when you take uh, these dictators, as bad as they may be, out of these places where you talk about Gaddafi or Saddam or you know what they're trying to do in Syria with Assad. When you remove these guys from power, just like we've seen in Libya, all you do is create a breeding ground, a battleground, and the group that eventually takes over, it just becomes a, a ISIS trading camp or a terrorist training camp. It's the same principle when you talk about the drug dealers. If you're going to remove somebody from power, regardless how bad they may be, you need to have some type of structure, some type of reform ready before you go and do that. You can't just take them, off, take them out, cut off the head of the snake, and hope that no other snakes come into the area. It's always going to happen. And finally tonight, I'm not your typical grandma, and this is a 81-year-old woman who shot and killed an intruder. You know, never in my whole life did I ever anticipate having to take another life, especially at age 80. Give me a break here. But it's something Barb says she'd do again in a heartbeat to defend the family she loved. I felt like if I hadn't, my son and I both might be dead, and my husband would have probably bled to death on the kitchen floor. And that's why you need a Second Amendment in this country. It is the great equalizer. So you can defend yourself against multiple attackers, people who have weapons, even if you are, in her case, a little more frail being 80 years old. So stay tuned after this. We'll have more special reports, special report from John Bound, and also the extended interview with Billy Corgan. This is what the residents of London have come to expect from the million-plus Muslims now living in areas they no longer feel safe living in or even visiting. This area here used to be um, inhabited by the indigenous people of Burnley, which would be British. They're moving to our community. And as you say, crime rate goes, sex, they are wanting our girls, oh, walking yeah. down the road at night time and you're getting stopped, how much love and all that. We yeah. can't come out after dark, can we? No, my daughter. And the kids bully our kids. Yeah. Like, they all team up on our kids, so our kids can't play out, they've got to be in all time. Do you know exactly. what I'm talking yeah. games? But this area was once a working class British community and now it resembles Bangladesh. Rise up and say, enough is enough. This is our country. We don't want any more coming into this country. We don't want any more immigration. I just got told yeah. to leave. You run, the, you run the country? You run the country? Yeah. You run the country, do ya? Yeah. I don't want to like... embarrass you in front of your community. You is that the best you've got? Britain. Go back to the desert. Go back to this the desert. This is Britain. We've got every right, right to, to be desert. here. Stopping it. For what? 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 This is our country. Why don't you go back to your own country? Brian, are you telling us to Shut stop? Up. Who are you talking to? This poster is basically showing how we will transform Buckingham Palace into a local mosque for the Muslims. Drugs will be banned, pornography will be banned, gambling will be banned. We do expect to enter into a struggle, if you like, of words, and maybe even more than that, uh, before we can see the fruition of uh, the Sharia, really, on state level. Muslims are here to stay! Muslims are here to stay! These people coming to our country, setting up their own legal system, enough's enough. But none of the evidence of internal malice towards the United Kingdom's host population by a growing Muslim population even exists according to London's new Muslim mayor, Sadiq Khan. In fact, Khan, a Labour Party favourite, is making no qualms about the rhetoric coming from across the pond via presidential candidate Donald Trump. Trump had expressed an exception to Khan visiting the country in lieu of Trump's temporary ban on Muslims entering the United States. Khan defied Trump's remarks with his own narrow rhetoric. 
Apparently, Khan is no leader, just another globalist puppet passing out blinders to the general population. In fact, Khan, barely a week into his role as London's mayor, is hurling veiled threats at the United States. His claim that Donald Trump's stance on Muslims is based in ignorance and that Trump's continued rhetoric will only lead to more attacks is a foolish statement to begin with. Hello? If Trump is ignorant on Muslim aggression being a reality, then why should we expect attacks? Khan has spoken at numerous events right alongside jihadists, including, as The Sun reported, a rally in 2006 with an extremist Muslim leader who threatened fire throughout the world. Sadiq Khan later defended Dr. Azam Tamimi, a senior figure in the Muslim Association of Britain, for using flowery language. London Mayor Sadiq Khan will be traveling to the United States and meeting with other globalist tool mayors like Chicago's Rahm Emanuel and New York City's Bill de Blasio, because it's vitally important to establish a network of global tyranny and the will of the multinational corporations on the local level. Mayor Khan, the people of the United States don't intend on committing our sovereignty to the trash bin of history. Your feigned ignorance of the true state of the refugee invasion preying on innocent Europeans and Americans is just as blatantly false as your mayoral campaign. John Bound for Infowars.com. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. This is a very special report. Joining me in studio now is musical icon and great patriot Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins fame. Now you've obviously sold millions of records. You're back on the road. And now you are joining us here in our new studio here in Austin, Texas. Welcome back. But this is the new old new yes. studio. So. Yeah, all the fans out there, all of your support helped to build this place. It's no longer a deep, dark cave of sadness. It actually is, feels welcoming, <laughs> or before it was sort of foreboding. Yes, very much foreboding, you know, which could be fitting sometimes within the info war. But so now you were on the Alex Jones show earlier today, and I thought it was just uh, really prescient, speaking about breaking people out of this trance. And, you know, I feel like we're truly living the Orwellian nightmare. And it's almost as if it's been programmed and preparing us for this, and the Matrix is, is here. Yeah, it's really bizarre to me because I grew up, um, I was born in 1967, and in school, at a very young age, we read Animal Farm and we read 1984. And of course, what I took from that is, this is never gonna happen in America. And we had to all take the Constitution test. So whether I was being propagandized in the positive, I was being informed that America is not like this. To actually see, in my lifetime, America go from the world that I believed in then to the world I see now is, is, is literally mind-blowing. And to be participating not only as a, at the citizen level, uh, in the local community level, you know, I have a, a business where I live in, uh, in outside of Chicago, and so I, you know, I deal with the local government and that type of stuff. But then also be a, a public person and be part of the zeitgeist at different times to be used and abused positively and negatively within the systems that exist today, and see how my participation um, is is a constant decision making between either either my helping and my hurting, am I informing or am I actually enslaving? Mm. Um, that's a difficult uh, thing to take on. Yeah, so to, to learn that, you know, what the collectivist vision in Animal Farm in 1984 is, was actually our future and not this preventative thing kind of blows my mind. <clears throat> I can't believe we're even having this discussion, if, if you can understand why I say that to you humbly. To be talking in America about, in 2016, you know, about, you know, Mao's a good idea and, and uh, uh, a socialist is running for president, and that's okay. And we're going to go back to these kind of crazy tax rates where we're going to completely disempower the innovators in our country mm. because the new class, uh, the new technocratic class, wants to keep their position and they want to keep anybody else from coming in the game. I mean, that's just crazy to me. So, Yeah, how do you think people can get around the millions of people that were murdered under these communist regimes and just say, well, you know, that just happened then? But and here's, here's the thing. 
you know, obviously I listen to you and I, I listen to Alex and I listen to David Knight and Jakari. I mean, you guys do a fine job of identifying the factual root. And of course, sometimes because you don't have all the information, you have to speculate. And as I once told Alex, literally sitting in this exact spot, you don't always have to be right. You just have to have the right intention to want to get to the truth. As long as you want to get to the truth and that's your intention, that's fine. But what I would say to you, and I say this very plainly to you, is that most people don't care about facts. Most people do not care about facts. I work in the entertainment business. The people in the entertainment business do not care about facts. They only care about facts when it involves a gross. We spent this much. How much do we make? How much do we lose? Up until that point, it's all in their mind. So for most Americans or most people listening internationally, it is in your mind. Mm. It, it literally, you are fighting phantoms that do, do not exist. Now, if you're intelligent, which I think most people that listen to this show are, are you don't see how you've been engineered and steered and people are heavily invested in convincing you of something. We all know the, the advertising model. Uh, women very much understand from a very young age, you start being told, you gotta look like this, you gotta think like this, you gotta do this in your hair, blah, blah, blah. Young men, it comes a little bit later and it usually comes through sports, which is why it's so heavily invested in sports. The beer, the culture, the bro, the blah, 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 blah. Okay, we all understand that and we don't, it doesn't really bother us. We like when a clever ad manipulates us to want us to buy a certain product or something. What we don't realize is, think about people who have trillions on the line getting you to believe a lie. So imagine here's somebody like Alex coming and he actually has the read. Or he's talking to other people who have the read and they can see 10 years down the road. You, you sit here in this spot and you present those facts to people and they go, what does that have to do with me? Right. So to me, the next stage in the info war is to get at the ground level, at the cultural level, which is where most people interface with the propagandizing and the manipulation and help them understand. Because I think most people's natural human instinct when they realize they're being manipulated is to get mad. Because ultimately it's an insult to their intelligence. Right, or to deny, 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 because they don't want to admit that they've gotten, they've been had. Or, or, uh, disenfranchise their sovereign right to make an independent decision based on fact. Now, most people don't care, like I said, if it's, they're being manipulated in buying a product. If they realize that they're ultimately enslaving themselves to a system that's not only going to hurt them, but it's going to hurt their children, that's when their instinct kicks in. Right. And that's when fact doesn't matter, right? So you can present people fact all day. If they are hypnotized, they are not going to hear you. They're conditioning your children. And so you'll see some of these Disney cartoons and things like that. Mm -hmm. We spoke about Shutterbug time, where it's this bug that's a drone that's spying on kids, and it's just conditioning them to be completely okay with constant surveillance, reporting back to central command about whatever it is that you're doing inside right. the privacy of your own so home. So let's explore that for a second. Now, I'm on the entertainment side. I'm in these meetings with people. I recently had a meeting with a big studio that I might participate in. Those people at the ground level are not part of some governmental cabal. Right. They might even themselves be okay with those ideas. So on the realm of opinion, somebody working in a big studio could say, Leanne, the, I, I've been friends with the creator of that show for 20 years. It's got nothing to do with government surveillance. Okay. And you could say, well, I disagree. So an observer would sit back and say, well, Leanne has an opinion, and this person over here who's invested in the series and put capital, and they believe in it, and they love it, and they think it's great for children or whatever. You, you present it as, have you thought of it like this? My perspective is, this is something that kind of, if, if I was a parent or, or uh, thinking of my own nieces and nephews, this kind of troubles me, and here's why. So what, all you're doing is you're presenting kind of a, a range of ideas to someone and letting them make the choice whether or not that's something they want their children participating in because maybe on their uh, particular range of belief they don't want their uh, children conditioned to believe that surveillance is okay because even if you can make an argument for surveillance is okay a lot of us that grew up in the in the 60s and 70s we were told don't trust strangers because uh, you know there was a rash of uh, a pedophile incident. I grew up around when John Wayne Gacy was killing kids. I mean, I, I literally lived down the road from where that happened. So you can imagine being 10 years old and hearing about kids being murdered and put in basements. I mean, it terrified us. So suddenly all the parents were like, don't trust strangers. So something as simple as that, which maybe has no uh, nefarious undertone, 
still at some point a parent might say, well, I don't necessarily want my kid watching that because I don't want them to trust authority blindly. Right. I want them to use their own minds. So I'd rather have a, a show that's more like it's teaching them how to think for themselves and problem solve than I want a show that's telling it's okay to be observed by a stranger. And that's not to assign a nefarious intent to the creator. And it's not to say you have to be right. You can just raise the question, and it's really more about the, the cultural discussion of whether it's appropriate in the wider culture to accept these ideas as normalized, which is where I get funky on that. Right. I don't like the normalization of things that really need heavy, intense peer and cultural review before we kind of stamp and say, that's okay. Drones, for example, is something, as particularly as a person in public life, and I would guess you as a, as a as young woman, that's a troubling thing. If you have to think every time you're near an open window and you're taking off or putting on your clothes or you're picking your nose or something, <laughs> you have to think, is somebody watching me and is this going to end up on a system? And is, this, is that 10 seconds going to haunt me for the rest of my life, particularly in a social media world where I can be tagged? And basically you work here, you're a public person. So those are issues you have to think through. So why isn't there a greater cultural peer review about the proper use of drones in, in, in situations. Why isn't there a, wide, a more wide-ranging discussion? That, to me, is a discussion we should have as citizens. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I know, for instance, when I switched over my phone to an Android, not even thinking about it, I didn't realize that you had to turn off all of these uh, systems. And at one point, I just randomly discovered that my phone had been tracking my most visited places. And, hey, isn't this great? Don't you want everyone to know where, the, where you work, where you live, where you shop? No, I don't want any. I mean, that's... Yeah. It's frightening yeah, to me. At one point, I'd link some social media thing to my phone. And as you can imagine, I have a lot of famous people in my, in my phone. And, and that social media system went in my phone because I downloaded the app and poached all the names and had posted them on the Internet. And I remember talking to somebody from the company, and they were like, well, those are private. In the hacking world? No, exactly. Hello? Yeah, it's, it's not private to people who have broken into the government office there in the right. Pentagon and have exposed okay. your These private These are things that we should discuss. So <laughs> I like the idea and I'm and, and, and pushing for, uh, you know, and I, and I think you're the perfect person to approach this from that systemic review. From the standpoint of the info war, are the are we okay? Are we okay? okay here's a new show. Are we com are we comfortable with these concepts? Here's a movie where, uh, you know, the the director of the movie is openly called for open borders. Mm -hmm. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with the messaging in the movie? Is that okay? Do we want to participate that on a cultural level? And I'm not calling for boycotts. I'm an artist. I'm calling for an open, free society that deals with these ideas equally and fairly. And that collectively, in the right use of the word, we can come to be a, a better cultural uh, point of view. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that, like, literally, okay, I'm, I'm talking to you, right? I could say a one word right now that would destroy my career. I could use the wrong racial epithet or say the wrong thing to you or look down at the wrong part of your body and be castigated. And it's a meme and I'm a horrible person every day through the media, through, through uh, advertising. We see people being degraded. We see people doing all sorts of things that should, we should be horrified as a culture. So we've normalized all sorts of, sorts of things. But now we live in a world where one word can destroy your life, right. but it's okay to, if you're a social justice warrior, spit in somebody's face. Right. That's okay because you have, uh, you've been, uh, you're a victim, so it's okay. Right. So under the same ideology, I didn't like the way uh, you, you spoke to me early, so I should be able to denigrate you because that's okay. I mean, that's that's where we're, we're losing the plot and quickly too, I would add. Right. Well, and that's something that is kind of a big issue right now is it's this whole cultural racial thing where um, you can't say anything if you're white. There was actually the white privilege conference that just took place, the 17th annual one, who knew? Um, but <laughs> God, I didn't get my invitation. No, this I know. <laughs> so, but there was a, a woman who had attended and she was tweeting out how the white speaker it took too long, and that's like the I actually, I actually did read that. Perfect example of white privilege. And he I went actually, over his time. And here's, now here's, that's a perfect example, okay? I'm the type of person, I saw that report, I was fascinated by it. I actually went to the woman's Twitter account, and I read a bunch of her tweets. Because as somebody in public life, I know not to just take your word for it. I wanted to see for myself, what is the messaging? What is the perspective? Maybe she said one dumb thing and she said 10 things that were really wise. I want to learn. So you can, if you can bring that into a wider frame, I think that's very, very helpful to people. 
to encourage investigation and not just take it. Because at the end of the day, if all if if this is propaganda one and they say you're just propaganda two, then it's always going to be an argument who's got the moral high ground. Right. And we definitely see that in the comment section that people are like, oh, well, this is that and this, you know. Uh, Leanne, you're a yeah. privileged white woman. You have no right to say that. Right. So by engaging in the wider topic of uh, free speech, uh, libertarianism, um, supporting values which you're not, you don't agree with, but but and but at the same time, sort of calling it for what it is. You know, you can engage without having to shut it down. Right now, we have like a whole movement in the youth. These people truly feel this is this is their civil rights movement of their time, and they feel like they're on the right. And so, if you, for instance, if it's a, a Trump anti-Trump rally. They think that people on the Trump side are just racist, homophobic, xenophobic, shut it down. I don't want to hear anything you say because I'm on the right side of history here and I don't even need to hear your facts. And so how do you um, kind of educate these people that possibly their ideas aren't authentically individual? My argument is you can't. They're too far gone. And that may sound pessimistic because I know that you're, you want a solution-based concept. Um, I think when somebody reaches the point where they literally cannot see a human being on the other side of the argument, um, and, and I'm not even talking about religion, okay? I'm talking about humanism. The law, as it's constructed in Western civilization, is based on the idea that uh, a human has a, has a sort of a sovereign right to exist. Uh, and uh, of course, people argue about when that life begins. That's a different subject. But the point is, is this sovereign right has a vote. They have a life and they have a right to live it pursuit of. And then we obviously have a different idea in America. So when somebody has reached the point where they literally do not see that person as a voice, a vote, and they have a story and they have a family. Look, I've said it before. I grew up around a lot of racists in my family. <clears throat> Would I call them bad people? No. Would I call them misinformed? Yeah. Was that, a, was that due to experience? Do they, do they have a right to their belief? They would argue that they had a right to their belief because something happened in 1984 and they had some guy from a different race say something and, and they were never gonna listen to that race again and anything to do, okay, that's racist as I, would defi as I would define it. When you reach a point where that person cannot even respect that person across them's path to arrive at a particular point, then what's the discussion about? You have no right. So you're talking about disenfranchising. There's no discussion. Their, their tactics in the social justice warrior movement are to, sh are to stifle and shut down free speech. And I would argue in the, in the, in the world of, uh, that I live in, which is the bare knuckle world, um, they're leveraging their position because they don't have power. Now, of course, their argument is they, they've been systemically disenfranchised by systems, right? Pick your poison on that. They might even have an argument, okay? But at the end of the day, if you don't recognize the leverage that they're using, you ultimately come back to the same conclusion, which is they don't have power because they are not on the moral high ground. The moral high ground would be, I want to engage you because ultimately I believe that my argument will win over your argument or I will place something in your heart like the mustard seed, like Jesus talked about, that will grow and make you realize the error of your ways. That is not what this is about. It is to shut you down, to leverage a minority position. And I'm not using the word minority in a racial pejorative way. I'm talking about groups that statistically don't have leverage to just vote their way through. How do we kind of see through that knowing like, OK, this is a this is a kind of an evolutionary step that we as humans need to take versus, OK, now I'm being told that this is what I'm being conditioned to accept. I, Socialism. I instance. think if you're curious, you have to start by separating the truth. I think st admitting to yourself your own truth is always a good place to start. Like when I watch some of the clips that you guys have been putting up at some of these protests, I have no respect for what these people are doing. I don't. They're shutting down free speech. They're shutting down processes that I, I just don't get it. To me, it's antithetical to the, the society that I believe in. And as I said on Alex's show, they're eventually going to come after me. It's just the way history works. Okay. But dot, 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 I try to listen to their argument. And where I do recognize the argument is having merit, I try to consider it. And then I try to think into terms of practical application. In essence, don't become them. Mm. Don't shut your ears. Okay. 
try to understand the forces at play. It's hard to tell someone who feels disenfranchised by the system or the, you know, the, the, the government or whatever the world they live in. Uh, you try to tell someone here who, who you, know, you might argue is taking advantage of our social welfare system or, or gaming the system somehow and say, look, you have it and, and you're telling me America sucks and you're spitting on the flag. <laughs> try go living in one of these third world countries and see how far that gets you. Um, you know, it's always very interesting to me and this is a very prickly point to make. It's very interesting to me when you see the way uh, gays and lesbians are treated in some other countries in the world. At the level of, if they have that level of vitriol for, let's say, Donald Trump as a candidate, because they feel it's antithetical to what they believe in, where's, where's, the, where's the five times greater condemnation for those societies that mm -hmm. are treating their people? Far worse right. than just words and ideas. I mean, it's always interesting to me that how people kind of pick their spots. Mm -hmm. that, that always rings a, a, it's like a red flag for me. Mm -hmm. That means they're really not in it at the real level. Right. And, and then you start realizing, look, most people are trendy. Right? Most people are trendy. For every five hardcore people that, that are there, they're spitting in your face. There's 50 people there just doing the. They just want to be a part of the scene. Yeah. 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 You. You know. <laughs> racist you know it's like <laughs> they wouldn't even know what it means what do you think about that that we have people um wanting to take away what makes this country so great and it gives them the right and the the freedom to go out there and say whatever they want and they want to now chip away at free speech trying to say well it's offensive and so should should offensive speech should you be allowed to do it you know not everyone's offended by speech. So okay. how do you... That's a fantastic question. And I'm going to say something that I think is probably uh, the most important thing to me in everything that we're talking about. Um, we all remember the cartoon, you know, uh, Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam or whatever, and draws the line. You don't step over that line. He steps over the line. And he draws another line and right. Okay. For me personally, we're at the last line. Free speech is the last line. So... If you're saying to me, look, what's more important, identifying with social movements that do have valid and real concerns as they see it from their own perspective and community. In essence, their voice does need to be heard and respected, even if at the end of the day you don't agree. Okay, if that can be done... While, at the, at, at, while maintaining free speech, in essence, we're kind of a rolling Linus ball of dust and we're just moving forward as civilizations do. Great. I'm more than happy to have that discussion. I'm more than happy to have that discussion with politicos, people in the entertainment business, social justice warriors. And I've had these discussions through the years with, I mean, when I, when I talked about God in the 90s in my songs, you know, the, the right wing preachers came at me. I was, uh, one of my proudest moments was I was uh, picketed in the last year by the-, the Westboro? Yeah. I was like, wow, badge of honor. This is awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm actually still dangerous, right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. To me, and I hope that this makes sense because I'm rambling a bit, but the free speech line, without free speech, none of those arguments matter. Right. Not a one. Because once we lose that, there's no end. And I'm sorry if you're a student in history and I've read plenty of books, uh, you name it. If you've ever seen the killing fields about Pol Pot and, you know, the Khmer Rouge, uh, you know, what Stalin did, you know, obviously what Hitler did, any socialist system, which tend to be left, by the way, just a little point in there. Once you cross that line, okay, you look at every totalitarian regime in the, in the last hundred and something years, who do they kill first? They kill the disabled. And who do they kill next? They kill the artists. Okay. Why are ideas, as John Lennon once sang, imagine da da da. Why are ideas so powerful? Because they are. They are the thing that cannot be defended against. Mm -hmm. An idea, a whisper, a rumor cannot be. No wall can stop the truth, right? So no matter what side you're on, left, right, libertarian, you lose the free speech lane, it's over. Because we all lose. Mm -hmm. Every one of us. And I don't care who you are, where you come from, where you're at on the wheel. Okay, which, why is, which does explain sort of in the, in the greater zeitgeist of the idea why the mega wealthy and the elites are preparing to go off-grid, off-planet, 
buying lots of land in Costa Rica or BC and all that stuff because they got the quarterback read and they see when that fur goes, it's going to fly. Yeah. We don't want to get there. That's my point. Once we lose that lane of free speech in this country, it's over. It, it might still be called America, but it is over. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what your trendy argument, I don't care what your hashtag argument is. If you do not stand for free speech, you do not stand for America. That means you want something else. And if you think your something else is going to be better than America, I'm here to tell you you're wrong. And I will fight that fight to my dying breath. Because look, I was propagandized as a kid to believe that everything America did was great. And like a lot of people, as I got into the world <clears throat> in the 70s and 80s, I realized that wasn't true. America has done plenty of horrible things. Start with the Native Americans and work your way backwards. <clears throat> so I'm no, you know, America's perfect, you know. I, I've never believed that, nor did my father. But I do believe America's better than any other political and social system that's ever been created in the world. Prove me wrong, I'm willing to listen. But we're Americans, we love our country, and if you're a true American, you even love the enemy. Right. So we can cry and laugh and, and shake our heads at the social justice warriors. True Americans and libertarians want them in that system. The social media is kind of the, the engine where a lot of these social justice movements is kind of gaining momentum, but it's also where they're being sort of corralled and controlled as well. So they can take your free speech and hide that line of code so it never trends or uh, the algorithms will just shut down and you won't be able to reach your audience. And so talk to people a little bit about how to use these systems for, for good or to use, you know, vote with your dollars or your feet, so to speak, to, to not allow them to start controlling us because they, they truly are. A lot of my friends are what I would qualify, quantify as average American citizens, my family. What do they do at a participatory level to either encourage or discourage things that they don't agree with? And I think it takes a little bit more savvy if we're in the info war. It takes a little bit more savvy to know how to get into those systems in a way that we can leverage our own position, just like the social justice warriors do. Um, but at the same time, not resort to the kind of the scummy part of it all, which is sort of leading people astray. Um, look. When you use the word liberty, um, most people don't find that word sexy. You know, racist has a lot more ooh, ooh ah to it than libertarian. Libertarian sounds like you're stuck in the back of a truck with Ron Paul and he's talking to you about like, you know, freedom. policy papers and freedom. It doesn't <laughs> sound very exciting to me, okay? You know, I, I tend to like the social argument. <clears throat> you have to start, this would be my argument, you have to start by identifying that the most powerful thing in the world right now are these technocratic systems that are in place, search engines, uh, the way we connect on these, on these social platforms. Governments have either encouraged these things to come along or quickly realizes that they were the new element, arms of control. And so you have to ask yourself whether your participation in these systems is actually enslaving you. Then you have to drill down a little further and you have to want to ask questions about um, if what you're doing and participating in is, is truly uh, as open as it seems. So if Twitter, for example, is full of people of a diverse set of opinions and you feel like, hey, it's, the, it's, it's capitalist, it's my idea versus yours, who tweets more, who gets more retweets, who says the right incendiary thing, who does the right mean, great. That, that's America, great. And I would only argue, you know, where, where do you cross the line? And you see it all the time. I mean, uh, uh, Infowars puts up articles. Uh, as somebody who's in the in the world, and I have to watch what I say. When you see a page that's literally, and the page is the Facebook page is assassinate Donald Trump, and and I believe Facebook comes out and says that doesn't violate our standards and practices. Yeah. Okay, that's where so, somebody like myself has to ask: Is my participation in the Facebook system, and I would call it a system, am I actually encouraging something which, as an American, I find offensive? Mm -hmm. And I also find it offensive that a business would support. You can call. I would have no problem with the page that said Donald Trump's a racist. Donald Trump's a homo. Uh, Donald Trump's a homophobe because because that's just opinion. The minute you talk about killing someone, <clears throat> sorry, that's where you need to step in as a business. Say I will not support that. So why does that? Why is that okay? But you can imagine what page you could create on Facebook today, and there would be calls for you to never work here at Infowars ever again. 
Right. That's, that's where it gets funky. So you have to be sophisticated enough to look at those systems and say, is my participation encouraging something that I know deep down is intrinsically not only flawed, but counterintuitive to what I, what I want to be part of? Mm -hmm. And in essence, your participation is condonement. Now, I run a business. I have a Facebook page. I need the Facebook page at this day to run my business. It's an effective system. I don't like everything. So that's just another piece of information that may ultimately push me off Facebook. And I'm willing to take the commercial and public hit of not having that reach that I have to the 4 million plus people that follow us on Facebook. Because at the end of the day, I as an American can't support that. So does it bother me? Yes. Do I have to have the argument in my head? Yes. And to this point, I haven't made that decision. If you're not having that argument in your own head, then you're not participating. And then to use Alex's term, you're just a drone who's just following around. And you're pretending you have no influence and you do. Mm. And I think, too, it's really time for a lot of us who are libertarians and who are for freedom and who are concerned and who do. We're not kind of in the trance. We do see we do need to start coming together and working and setting up our own systems to counteract their systems right. that they have. That's why I would use the word empowerment. Empowering people with, let's not call it the facts and the truth. The facts and truth are always kind of ephemeral. It's this eye of the beholder stuff. Empowering people to have a better range of decision making as far as how they approach their social systems, I think that's powerful. Then if you take the extra step and you say, uh, like maybe Infowars sets up its own version of social media, so that like-minded businesses are able to participate in a system that is ultimately holistic mm -hmm. to the ideas that you would believe in. Yeah, some open source social media networks as well. To I think those days are coming soon. Yeah. <clears throat> and trust me, if 20% of people suddenly jumped off Facebook, they would notice. Yeah. They look at those numbers every day. Just right. like I would notice if suddenly there were 20% empty seats. <clears throat> well, it's like you have these huge groups like the Soros-backed groups there, that they're, they've all joined together now, all these little minority movements, they've all decided to come together, and now they are of a smaller majority but the movement. Beauty of, and so people are, you know, you got to understand what you're up against with you know, these machines. Again, from, a, from a capitalist free market position, I don't have any problem with that. If, if seven independent hot dog stands band together to form a hot dog association because they need to leverage their position in the market, great. They should have the right to do that. The thing you know, though, and, I, and, and you know it, and you can know it in your heart, and I'm going to say it right to the camera, <clears throat> they will all turn on each other. The left always eats its own. Mm. And the minute they gain what they want, they'll turn on each other because they're rapacious and they can't help themselves. Yeah. They have to have a cause. Their identity is born of the cause. There was a great article that came out when the gay uh, marriage, the, uh, the Supreme Court, all that stuff. Okay, gay marriage is now part of law of the land. OK, there were articles about people being depressed because the movement was over. They'd won. Yeah. You know, if that was your argument and you wanted it and you got it. Great. That's an incredible victory. If you, that's the side you're on and having grown up and watch people die of AIDS and, and being part of that in my own particular way. I thought, good, great. You got what you wanted. Got to go on to the next thing, because it was about the identity of waving that particular flag. The victory was not in the thing. The victory was in the march. Yeah, being a part of that big movement. So and understand that's... a lot of these trendies, the minute the thing gets boring or it gets too hard or it breaks down into policy, social movements are easy to begin. You know, you're being disenfranchised. Yeah, your vote counts. Yeah. When you get into the level of policy and regulation and sitting, like I have at the local civic board meeting for four hours, and they're talking about water mains. That's where most people, that's where the trendy stuff out. stops. Yeah, they'll yeah. tap out and or they'll turn on each other. So at least in your own heart, when you watch them uh, abusing InfoWars reporters, no, they can't, that, they, they're, look in 20 years and see where they're at. <laughs> they, won't be, they won't be still twizzling the, the New Year's toy, guarantee you. Right, yeah, well, that's why a lot of people point out how, it, it, for instance, Bernie Sanders isn't really uh, reaching a lot of people that are 30 and up or even 40 and up, because it's a lot of just young people that don't necessarily have the experience. 46% of Americans don't pay any form of tax, at least in terms of federal or state. Of course. Free stuff, great. Give me more free stuff. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. I'll no take freedom. One. That's just why I'm for Bernie. Stuff. I want more free stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, Billy, thank you so thank much you, for Andy. joining us in Total studio. Pleasure. This is kind of the first of a series of social, cultural, Breakdown. It's we're going to be doing. the beginning of your own yeah. personal revolution. <laughs> yes, indeed. Our individual, true individual ideas. 
Well, thank you so much. Thank you. There's a great interview between Billy and Leanne that happened right here in the studio. Now, I knew of the Smashing Pumpkins for many years, but I didn't know how political Billy was until I started watching this show. And then I went back and saw some of the previous interviews he had done with Alex Jones. Well, thank you so much, Billy, for stopping in studio. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.